EST, and that doesn't include the Auckland Regional Fuel Tax for those of you living in Auckland, and the rest are shipping costs and, and import and margin. Cheaper in Auckland, so apparently. Tax, mm. <laughs> tax is um, a big component of the petrol that we pay. All right. Um, the um, Z Energy spokesman, Chris, uh, said their prices were heavily based on the international market. Barrel prices are really high. Uh, average price of fuel reached a 30-year high, set to continue. Um, is it out of our hands? I mean, there was going to be a commission about this, wasn't there? I don't know where that's uh, set yet, but um, what do you reckon? Well, I think the other part of the story is there's, there's undoubtedly some truth in that, but how come uh, Auckland has got, a, I think it was an 11 cents increase in, in a regional fuel tax? That seems to be passed on to other parts of the country. In fact, it's being paid by people in the South Island. Uh, because what you notice is that uh, in more competitive parts of Auckland, the price is comparatively low compared to other regions in, in the South Island. So you've got to say, hang on, there's a bit more to this than just movements and exchange rates. But mm. I find I'm terribly conflicted on this because... In what way? Well, in the sense that as a consumer, I'm spending 140 bucks about every 10 days to fill the, the, the car. On the other hand, we see what fossil fuels are doing to the environment, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, that drives people away from cars, it drives them to smaller cars, it drives them into electric vehicles and all those kind of things. So there's a sense in which... This is part of a bigger conversation. Turning the negative into an, a positive. Oh, well, not completely, because here's the other part of it. I'm a policeman and I'm living on $60,000 a year, so I can't live in central Auckland, but I've got to come to secret central Auckland most days. So I live out a long way from Auckland, so I'm spending 100 bucks a week on petrol. And I think this is the terrible conflict that we're feeling, is that the cost of this is ultimately borne by those least able to carry the cost, but they're mm. typically the ones who live furthest away from the centres, and so thus they don't have if, any choice. If, 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 I mean, look, let's look at drastic solutions. If, Heather, uh, th- they keep on climbing, could we get back to the day, because I can recall them uh, in the 70s, late 70s, uh, you could not drive, you had to pick a day where you couldn't, dri- days, you couldn't yes. drive your car. Well, but most people had two cars, and they would pick different days, so it made, it had little impact at all, little oh, if right. any impact at all. Um, no, I remember those those carless days well. Um, look, I think that um, electric cars will change the landscape significantly, but for the moment they're too expensive for most people to be able to afford. That will come right. Um, but for the moment we're, we're lar- largely stuck with what we have. Very interesting stuff. Your thoughts on that? Um, uh, what do you think is the option there? I wanted to, I wanted to sneak this in because I found this really fascinating. Uh, Heather, you might have something to say on this. The Greens mm-hmm. are calling a Parliament to add uh, a new plaque to commemorate the New Zealand Wars. There are 33 other plaques commemorating famous battles uh, New Zealanders have died in: Gallipoli, Passchendaele, Afghanistan, Vietnam. Uh, but none can commemorate the New Zealand Wars, a series of armed battles in the mid-1800s between Māori and the New Zealand government. Uh, do you both support adding another plaque commemorating the New Zealand Wars? Heather, you first. Yes, I, I do. I think that Gareth Hughes' idea from the Green Party is actually a very good one, and I liked his idea of putting this new plaque um, in the space that exists above the, the Speaker's chair. Um, I, I've got a personal interest. I actually asked for the battlements to be updated before I left Parliament in my valedictory speech. Right. They have been, and I think this is an important part of our history, and it should be commemorated. Chris, finally? 100% agree with Heather. 3,000 mm. Māori were killed during those wars. It's time we recognise that. It's been a great panel. Great to have you both on. Uh, Heather, Roy and Chris Clark, thank you very much. Thank Jim you, Laura is uh, back on the hot seat on Monday. Your responses have been fantastic today. Have a great weekend. Thank you to Ali, uh, producer, all uh, week long, and see you later. Kia ora, good evening, and welcome to Checkpoint. I'm Rowan Quinn, and for John Campbell. Tonight, gone by lunchtime, embattled Labour MP Claire Curran resigns as a minister after a horror week in Parliament. And emotional scenes in the High Court in Hamilton as Corey Jeffries is sentenced to at least 11 years behind bars for the murder of his partner Kim Richmond. We take, a fir- we take first home buyers inside a Kiwi build home ahead of the public open homes tomorrow. A Dunedin woman fed up with living in a mouldy, cold and rotting rental property says she faced spending nights in her car because there was nowhere else to go. And we are live in Nelson with our rugby reporter Joe Porter, rugby reporter Joe Porter ahead of the All Blacks Argentina match. 
RNZ News at five. Maloa Lalei, good afternoon. Ko Katrina Bat in Aho. The Labour MP Claire Curran has resigned as a minister, saying she can no longer endure the pressure she's been under. She's the first casualty of the coalition government following a series of errors that led to her demotion from Cabinet in August and now her resignation to the back bench. Here's our political reporter Joe Moyer. Claire Curran called the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern last night to say she was resigning from her broadcasting and associate ACC portfolios after the pressure on her had become intolerable. The Dunedin South MP took personal leave yesterday after fumbling an answer in Parliament about using her personal email account for government business. She was recently sacked from Cabinet and stripped of two portfolios after failing to properly declare a meeting for the second time. Ms Curran admits she's made mistakes and Ms Ardoon agreed it was right for her to resign. The opposition leader Simon Bridges says the public deserves to know what other government business Ms Curran has used her personal email for. From Parliament, Joe Moyer. A man who killed his partner and covered it up, claiming she'd run away, will spend at least 11 years behind bars. 46-year-old Corey Jeffries was found guilty at a trial in the High Court in Hamilton in July for murdering 42-year-old Kim Richmond. Her body was found in her vehicle submerged in Lake Arapuni, not far from her South Waikato home in June last year, 10 months after she was killed. At sentencing, Justice Fitzgerald said the offending had been tragic for all involved. Not only for Ms Richmond herself, uh, but your three children, Ms Richmond's parents and other members of her family, uh, and the broader community uh, in which you and Ms Richmond lived. Uh, So too, I'm sure, for you and your family. Justice Fitzgerald says Geoffrey's treatment of Ms Richmond's body was callous. Patients with advanced breast cancer are receiving less treatment and are often bumped down the treatment list. Findings from a study released today by the Breast Cancer Foundation show the average survival time in New Zealand for patients with advanced cancer is half that in Australia and Canada. The average lifespan once someone is diagnosed with advanced breast cancer is 16 months. Half of patients do not receive any treatment. The research manager for the Breast Cancer Foundation, Adele Gautier, says patients are telling them they feel forgotten. Advanced breast cancer is where it's spread beyond the breast and lymph nodes to another part of the body. A $150 million investment in Gisborne's economy announced by the government today is being described as a game-changer. The bulk of the money from the Provincial Growth Fund will be spent on improving roading with smaller amounts for tourism and forestry projects. The Chief Executive of the Gisborne District Council, Nadine Thatcher-Swan, says the money is a game-changer for the region and will create much-needed jobs. And Steve Breen of the region's Economic Development Agency, Activate Taraifati, says roading is crucial to the region's economy. Success of everything else comes off the back of having a strong roading infrastructure. So the uh, commercial opportunities that we're, we're hoping to realise really do need uh, the support of that roading network to make them happen. Steve Breen, the General Manager of Activate Taira Fiti. The President of Local Government New Zealand says scientific facts need to trump the emotions of residents when it comes to making decisions on climate change. Dave Cull's comments come at the organ- came at the organisation's Climate Change Symposium in Wellington, looking at the coming challenges of sea level rise. He says councils need to take action based off facts, but residents need to be informed along the way. So that when you say, look, hard decisions have to be made here, there's not sufficient, there's not an irrational demand for something that's simply not possible. Dave Carl says councils also need better legislative support from central government to prevent necessary decisions being subjected to court action. Choppy conditions have made it too hard to locate a humpback whale entangled in ropes in the Bay of Islands and the search has been called off for the day. It was spotted yesterday off Deepwater Cove with ropes from a cray pot around its mouth. The Department of Conservation says the whale can't feed and will be getting weaker. The search will continue tomorrow when the weather is expected to improve. 
The All Blacks have been mobbed by fans in Nelson ahead of their first ever test in the city against Argentina. Tomorrow night's game will be played before a capacity crowd of 21,000 at Trafalgar Park. The All Blacks have been preparing in Nelson all week and today players chatted with youngsters in town and signed rugby balls. George Arakis, a junior player from Atamoteri, queued with friends for half an hour in Trafalgar Street to see his favourite All Blacks. Geordie Barrett and Bowden or, and Ben Smith. Do you play rugby? Uh, yes, Rangers in the Mootshree. Um, with my friend Charlie, Jamie, Costa, Alex and Sam. So you're all going to the game? Yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone here is. Who's going to win? All Blacks! A junior rugby fan, George Arakis. It's five and a half past five. Sport, the country's pole vaulting star Eliza McCartney has been forced to withdraw from the upcoming Continental Cup in the Czech Republic. Two weeks ago, McCartney injured her heel and had to withdraw from the Diamond League final in Zurich. Athletics New Zealand's high performance director Scott Goodman says while the 21-year-old was on the mend, the pain is too much to bear. She was recovering and was able to run during the week and planned to compete here in Ostrava at the Continental Cup. But she did a session, she was trying to take off, like the heel has to plan into the ground and that caused pain. She is at a level that she, she won't be able to compete here. Scott Goodman. The transgender weightlifter Laurel Hubbard will return to competition this month after fears her career was over when an arm injury forced her out of the Commonwealth Games. Hubbard and Gold Coast Games, uh, Gold, Coast Games gold medalist David Letty are to headline the national champs. The New Zealand weightlifting high performance director Simon Kent says Hubbard's return after her injury is a testament to her hard work, but he's unsure if she'll make the world championships in November. We'll get through nationals and then depending on how she performs there, so that might mean world championships this year, but it really will depend on whether she hits the uh, elite grade, which would qualify for that, and just where, where she's at with her return. Simon Kent from New Zealand Weightlifting. That's the news. Tonight on Night's Country Life looks at the impact of this week's return of winter. Mel Parsons is Friday night's live act, and we have a sonic tonic dedicated to gold, because there's plenty of it in them their airwaves. Speaking of which... And in the seriously gross department, new research has found that airport security trays carry more cold germs than toilets. You have to have people touching these viruses and then getting enough on their face and their nose to actually start an infection. That's Lately with Karen Hay, 10pm weeknights on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland, Auckland and Coromandel Peninsula. Fine spells today, but a few showers clearing Northland and Auckland this afternoon or evening. Fine tomorrow, apart from isolated showers from afternoon. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, Eastern Bay of Plenty, the eastern ranges of Taupo and Taihape. Periods of rain heavy at times today with possible thunderstorms about Gisborne and Hawke's Bay. Rain easing to showers tomorrow. Waikatu to North Taranaki, the remainder of Bay of Plenty and Taupo, also Taumaranui. Fine apart from isolated showers in Waikato from tomorrow afternoon. South Taranaki to the Kapiti coast, mainly fine, isolated showers about the hills and ranges. Wellington and Wairarapa, cloudy with a few showers. For the South Island, mainly fine, however areas of cloud about North Canterbury and Fiordland and a few showers about coastal Marlborough. The Chatham Islands, low cloud and rain, strong southeasterlies rising to gale tomorrow. It's eight and a half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. And you're with Rowan Quinn here on Checkpoint and for John Campbell. Um, we have some breaking news up shortly. Verdicts are expect expected in um, the trial of some prison guards accused of uh, assaulting prisoners. In fact, they have been acquitted of those charges relating to an attack on a prisoner inside the country's maximum security prison. And we'll go to our court reporter, Edward Gay, who's been covering that case very shortly. Uh, but we begin with the embattled Labour MP, Claire Curry. She's resigned as a minister after a bumbling stint in government, citing the relentless and intolerable pressure she's been under. It follows a series of errors, leading firstly to her demotion from Cabinet last month and now to her resignation to the backbenches. Here's our political reporter, Craig McCulloch. 
a month shy of a year in government, the coalition with its first ministerial casualty. Today I advise the Prime Minister that I have resigned from all my ministerial portfolios. Claire Curran in her Dunedin South electorate, a minister no more. The pressures of the job, too much. I am, like the rest of you, a human being and I can no longer endure the relentless pressure that I've been under. I've made some mistakes. They weren't deliberate undermining of the political system. But my mistakes have been greatly amplified and the pressure on me has become intolerable. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says she accepted Ms Curran's resignation last night, noting the unacceptable distraction for the government. I'm of course disappointed we've come to this. I do think she had something to offer. But all of us are here at the will of the New Zealand public. If we're unable to fulfil our roles, we need to recognise when that happens. Claire's recognised it and that's why she's resigned. The news came at midday. Hours earlier, Ms Ardern was on News Talk ZB not a mention of what was to come. Good morning. Have you spoken to Claire Curran yet? Yes, I have. And given an opportunity to elaborate, she picked her words carefully. Are you considering cutting ties with her, though, firing her? Uh, no, because I think she's paid a price. Um, the, I have huge expectations of my ministers and those in the ministry, but I also accept that from time to time they will also have bad days. Nationals leader Simon Bridges says the Prime Minister isn't playing it straight. This is a Prime Minister who, into the election, said this would be the most open and transparent government New Zealand has ever seen. It has been anything but. It's been weak, it's been incompetent, it's been shambolic. Ms Curran found more sympathy on her home turf. Dunedin voters disappointed in the development and expressing support for their local MP. I think it's a shame because she had a lot to offer. And I think this is the trouble now, is that the media are inclined to get in there with tooth and nail when somebody makes a slip up, but everybody does. The opposition are like Attila the Hun, and these people are trying to do the best they can. She has my sympathy. What can I say? It's all been said, I think. I just wanted to stay where she is. I wanted to stay in Parliament. She will stay on in Parliament, but now on the backbenches, an ignominious end to her ministerial stint. In April, it emerged Ms Curran had had an undeclared meeting with RNZ news boss Carol Hirschfeld. It cost Ms Hirschfeld her job. I would not have that meeting again. Then in August, a second offence, again failing to properly disclose a meeting, this time with Derek Handley, a candidate for the new role of Chief Technology Officer. Ms Curran was demoted from Cabinet, stripped of two portfolios. I know that I made a mistake and that there had to be consequences. But the pressure was still building. It came to a head this week, culminating in this display in Parliament on Wednesday. Um, uh, uh, I, haven't, um, I haven't used my... Um, I ha I've answered um, OIA, uh, uh, OIA responses and personal... The then minister crumbling over questions about the use of her personal email to conduct government business. Uh, you know, that, that, that has, that's what I've done. The opposition now zeroing in on those emails, asking what the government has to hide. The only way we will know if there is more to this or not is by the Gmail account and the official information within that being released. Otherwise, it just looks like it could be a preemptive cover-up. I use my Gmail account infrequently for work, and it would have been discoverable, and it hasn't been used to just conceal anything. Chris Farfoy has taken over as Broadcasting Minister. Ms Ardern will be hoping his tenure will be less scandal-prone than his predecessors. Atu iti whare parimata mō te hōtaka o te ahiahi, ko Craig McCullough and we'll have more on all of this from our political editor Jane Patterson after six tonight. A man who killed his partner and covered it up claiming she'd run away will spend at least 11 years behind bars. 46-year-old Corey Jeffries was found guilty at a trial in the High Court in Hamilton in July for murdering 42-year-old Kim Richmond in 2016. This afternoon he was sentenced to life with a non-parole period of 11 years. Now reporter Andrew McRae was in court. Kim Richmond's body was found in her vehicle submerged in Lake Arapuni, not far from her South Waikato home in June last year, ten months after she was killed. Jeffries had admitted her manslaughter but denied murder. In her victim impact statement, Kim Richmond's mother Raywin made her feelings pretty clear. 
No sentence imposed will ever replace the time we will spend without our daughter, sister, best friend, but most of all, mother to her three children. You may have fathered Kim's children, but you are not fit to be called their father. May you rot in prison as you left Kim to rot in the lake. Mrs Richmond says the fact Jeffrey's kept up the pretense for 10 months that Kim had run away from her family disgusts her. We searched every day for Kim, knowing she would not be alive, but we needed to find her body. We had a map of the wider area of Arahina, and each day we would look to see where we would search next, and you also looked at that map with us. Oh, how you must have laughed behind our backs. Mrs Richmond described Jeffries as a Jekyll and Hyde character. Still you maintained your innocence. We started to arrange Kim's funeral, and you, Corey Jeffries, were there, laughing about the songs and flowers to choose. Then the day before the funeral, you were arrested for Kim's murder. Once more, we had to explain to the children you had been charged with the murder of Mummy. Our hearts were just broken. The Crown Prosecutor Jacinda Foster told the court that Jeffrey's actions were profoundly callous, calculated and violent. Having killed her, uh, the defendant then treated Ms Richmond with the utmost contempt in terms of the disposal of her body. And in what I submit can only be considered a cynical and calculated way, he acted to undermine the close and loving relationship that she had with her family. Jeffrey's lawyer Thomas Sutcliffe said it was a random act of violence that was clearly unscripted. And his attempts afterwards, uh, whilst they've been understandably described as being cold and callous, really are the desperate attempts uh, of a man to cling to whatever else was left of his life, more particularly his association with his three children. Justice Fitzgerald told Jeffries she didn't believe the killing was premeditated, but acknowledged that he was the only person who knows what precisely happened. She said the aggravating features on the case included a gross breach of trust. But that factor, combined with what I consider to be the second aggravating factor, namely your treatment of her body after you had killed her, characterises this offending as callous. The judge said Jeffrey's growing deep hostility to his partner because he thought she was having an affair contributed to whatever triggered events leading to her death. But in this case, I accept Mr Sutcliffe's submission that there is no evidence of, for example, a, sus a sustained and severe attack, such as multiple or any broken bones, fractures to the skull or facial bones, or the use of a weapon evidenced by stab wounds or the like. Justice Fitzgerald started with a non-parole period of 12 years, but reduced it by one year because Jeffries had no prior convictions and had been a positive and active member of the community. She also took into account that he'd been on electronic bail for one year. In Hamilton for Checkpoint, Cor Andrew McRae-Tene. In the last few minutes, three prison guards have been acquitted of charges relating to an attack on a prisoner inside the country's maximum security prison, Paremoremo. The jury returned the not guilty verdicts at the High Court in Auckland a short time ago. And our reporter Edward Gay's been in the court and he joins us now on the phone. Edward, what was the reaction when the verdicts came through? Good afternoon, Rowan. Well, yeah, look, the, the three defendants filed into the dock here at the Auckland High Court. They looked visibly nervous. Each one uh, held held their um, hands together and in, in, in their fronts as um, those those verdicts were read out. And there was an audible gasp in the public gallery. Some some members in the public gallery actually wiped tears from their eyes. And once all three verdicts of not guilty were read out, there were uh, cheers and clapping. Um, and then clapping again after Justice Gordon thanked the jury for their job. And it was a bit of a tricky case, Edward. Well, it was. I mean, this, this case uh, was unusual. It, it started actually with an attack on a prison officer. One of those in the dock, uh, Desmond Farfoy, was stabbed multiple times in the head and face by one of the inmates. Uh, and he, uh, look, the, the court saw uh, this, uh, the, the aftermath of this court on security uh, camera footage. Two of those inmates were armed with shanks, uh, you know, a makeshift sort of a weapon they, they, that they used to attack the prison officers. 
uh, and Mr. Farfoy, he um, he was involved in actually taking this uh, prisoner to the to the ground. He he uh, was then caught on a body camera of uh, one of his colleagues uh, kicking the prisoner in the head repeatedly. He said he couldn't remember this. He'd passed out from from loss of blood. He couldn't remember the kicking. Uh, and um, and then at another point, his co-accused, uh, Widamu Paikia, who's also been found not guilty this afternoon, he put that uh, prisoner in a figure four leg lock and broke the prisoner's leg and dislocated his ankle. Uh, Mr Paikia found not guilty. He um, we, we heard evidence um, to, um, during the trial that... Uh, Mr. P- Mr. That that the that the inmate had been resisting still when put in that figure four leg lock. Vidra Devasi, another co-accused, he was charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice. Again, a not guilty verdict for Mr. Devasi. He was charged with that charge because he had shifted a camera away from the incident. Uh, his lawyer argued that 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 camera had been moved away to locate a third prisoner involved in the attack, and uh, those look those not guilty verdicts came back this afternoon, um, and yeah, the, the the public gallery just erupted into into claps. Well, look, thanks for joining us with that so quickly. That's our reporter Edward Gay, who's at the High Court in Auckland. Burt Reynolds, whose good looks and charm made him one of Hollywood's most popular actors, has died aged 82. He died of a heart attack in Florida. Reynolds had a career spanning 30 years, starring in films like Deliverance, The Longest Yard, Smokey and the Bandit and Boogie Nights. Tributes from the movie world have flowed in. Arnold Schwarzenegger said Burt Reynolds was one of my heroes. He was a trailblazer. He showed the way to transition from being an athlete to being the highest paid actor and he always inspired me. And Reynolds' co-star Sally Field tweeted this, There are times in your life that are so indelible they never fade away. They stay alive even 40 years later. My years with Bert never leave my mind. He'll be in my history and my heart for as long as I live. Rest, buddy. Now the BBC's Nick Hyam looks back on his life and his works. We killed him, Andrew. Shot him in the back. A mountain man. Burt Reynolds in Deliverance as a weekend tourist up against the American wilderness and its murderous inhabitants. God damned if I want to come back up here and stand trial with this man's aunt and his uncle. Maybe his mom and his daddy sitting in the jury box. It was the film he was most proud of. He'd cut his teeth in scores of film and television westerns, becoming something of a sex symbol in the process. He was notoriously pictured naked for a cosmopolitan centrefold. He starred in movies like The Longest Yard, in which he played the coach of a prison football team. He'd wanted to play professionally himself until a youthful injury ended his chances. And in the 1970s, he became Hollywood's top box office star. Smokey and the Bandit was one of a series of films in which he drove a car very fast while making wisecracks. No, I mean, uh, what do you do besides drive fast? Have fun. Is this fun? Driving? Driving, talking to me. Both his co-star Sally Field in that film was one of his many conquests. More highly popular movies like The Cannonball Run and Sharky's Machine followed, but his career was running into trouble. He'd acquired a reputation as a hard-drinking womaniser who earned a fortune and spent a fortune. He was offered fewer good parts and eventually went bust, owing $11 million. There was an acrimonious divorce, he became the star of a long-running television sitcom and began sporting a wig. It took years for his film career to recover, though he eventually got an Oscar nomination for his performance as an ageing porn film director in Boogie Nights. You come into my house, my party, to tell me about the future. It was a roller coaster progress, which proved, if nothing else, that he was one of Hollywood's more resilient stars. Well, the career high was uh, that I got nominated uh, for that film. <clears throat> and... Uh, the career low was uh, when I couldn't get a job, and that was uh, not not too long before that. I was having a rough time. And that report from the BBC on Bert Reynolds, who's died today, aged 82. 
Well, Nelson has been soaking up the sun and the atmosphere of hosting its first ever All Blacks test. 21,480 fans will be on hand to watch the sellout match against Argentina, with Trafalgar Park's capacity increased by nearly 15,000 temporary seats. Our rugby reporter Joe Porter is in Nelson, and he spent the day finding out how much this match means to the locals. He joins us now via live view. Joe, you're at the place to be tonight. That's right, I'm here in Sunny Nelson at the Freehouse Bar with, of course, an Argentinian barbecue and some music going on behind me and lots of people soaking up what has been some fantastic Nelson sun this week. I was in town earlier today and there were hordes of people around, workplaces dressed up in black and white, hordes of school children running around chanting and cheering for the All Blacks, holding placards. Some of these kids were only knee-high to some of their All Blacks idols. <laughs> Primary schools were out in force, chaperoned by equally rugby-mad teachers. Whereabouts are you guys from? St Joseph's. And how many of your kids have you brought out today? We've got 20 here, so we've been loving rugby all week. Loving having the first test oh, ever in Nelson? amazing, so exciting for us, for our whole region. Yeah, it's fantastic. Hopefully another one comes back. Totally, totally, absolutely loving it. Sonny Bill Williams loving it too. He says getting to the provinces is a humbling experience. You definitely see a, a lot stronger reaction, obviously, because we don't get to, you know, come to towns like this. It makes it that much more special, and um, I'm pretty sure most of the towns either here today or at the barbecue just up the road. So it's a special feeling when you can uh, look at all these kids and the smiles on their faces. That's awesome. It's cool for players then to come to the provinces too. Yeah, of course, bro. 100 percent, 100 percent. Local fan Dave proving just what it means to have the All Blacks in town. Oh, it's pretty huge, isn't it? You just got to look at the crowds. The crowds of kids, anyone anyway, chanting and that going on, you know, it's massive. City's been packed, the fans are out in force. It's been a good good week, hasn't it? Oh, it's been a great week. It's been brilliant. Like, we live over the hill in between, we get them in Nelson, you know, so we've been over about probably three or four times this week just to try and stalk them, I suppose. You say when you're at them, <laughs> like everyone else is doing, so it's, yeah, it's, it's just dragging people out from everywhere, you know, the what wops and living. Yeah, great. The All Blacks went through their captain's run at Trafalgar Park in the Nelson Sun this afternoon and skipper Kieran Reid says the town's energy this week has been infectious. It's been an awesome week. Uh, the community's got right behind us and we've certainly felt the support and felt the love from all the Nelson community so it's awesome to, to play in these parts of New Zealand and obviously the first time here in, in Nelson so look, we've had a great time and you know the best way we can repay them is for our performance. And he hopes this isn't the first and last test played in Nelson. Hey, one day, mate. Certainly, it's uh, yeah, it's obviously an awesome stadium. Maybe an afternoon game, mate. How good's this, eh? And look, Captain Kieran Reid is not the only one who would like to see a test return to Nelson. It is, of course, a wonderfully sunny place. The first time that a rugby game at test has been played here. Quite strange considering Nelson is home to the oldest rugby club in New Zealand. The Argentinians have loved it. They've been in Auckland until Thursday. They wish they'd come here a lot earlier in the week because of this Nelson sun. And of course, Captain Kieran Reid was given the key to the city today by the Nelson Mayor. Nelson are really trying to bring this game back here, hopefully in the future. We know that this was a kick in the butt to Christchurch, Nelson getting this test, telling Christchurch to build a stadium or you will not get test matches back. But let's hope it's not just a one-off for, for Nelson and for the city that holds the oldest rugby club in New Zealand. Hopefully it's not the first and the last test for Nelson. Let's hope we see another one here and let's hope the All Blacks do the town justice tomorrow night with a fantastic and fitting performance. Absolutely. Have a fantastic weekend there. Thank you very much. That's Joe Porter, our rugby reporter there in Nelson for that historic test being played tomorrow. <laughs> Coming up here on Checkpoint, an Auckland mother launches a petition calling on the government to fund EpiPens. There are tense scenes at the UN Security Council a day after the British government named and charged two Russian military intelligence officers for the nerve agent attack in Salisbury. We take a first home buyer inside a Kiwi build home ahead of the public open homes tomorrow and a Dunedin woman fed up with living in a mouldy, cold and rotting rental property says she faced spending nights in her car because there was nowhere else to go. As always, we love your feedback. Uh, you can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. 
Facebook us Checkpoint with John Campbell or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. Right now, here's Katrina Batten with the headlines. The National Party's leader says Claire Curran's resignation from her ministerial portfolios has done real damage to the credibility of both the Prime Minister and the government. The Labour MP has been in the spotlight after being demoted from Cabinet for failing to record meetings properly. She also struggled to answer questions in Parliament over using a personal Gmail account to arrange meetings. National Simon Bridges says the public deserves to know what other government business Ms Curran has been conducting using her personal email. Supporters of three corrections officers charged with attacking a prisoner clapped and cheered in the public gallery as the jury returned verdicts of not guilty. The Crown's case was that Desmond Farfoy kicked one of the in kicked an inmate on the ground after being stabbed. Another officer, Widamu Paikia, put the prisoner in a leg lock, breaking his leg. The third officer charged, Viju Devasi, said he moved a camera away from the scene because he was looking for another prisoner. A 46-year-old man who killed his partner and covered it up, claiming she had run away, was today sentenced in the High Court in Hamilton to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 11 years. Corey Jeffries was found guilty at a trial in, Ju in July of murdering Kim Richmond. The body of the 42-year-old was found in her vehicle submerged in Lake Arapuni 10 months after she was killed. Ms Richmond's mother read out her victim impact statement before the sentencing and said she hopes Jeffries rots in prison as he left her daughter to rot in the lake. A $150 million investment in Gisborne's economy announced by the government today has been described as a game changer. The bulk of the money from the Provincial Growth Fund will be spent on improving roading with smaller amounts for tourism and forestry projects. The Chief Executive of the Gisborne District Council says the money is a game changer for the region and will create much needed jobs. The most senior doctor working with asylum seekers on Nauru has been told to leave the island. The ABC says the doctor's removal comes after an increase in the number of children referred for medical transfer off the island. The Gold Coast doctor, Christopher Jones, and the Nauru government have both declined to comment. Those are the headlines. I'll be back at six. Thank you very much, Katrina. And we're turning to business now with Nona Peltier. And Nona, there's been another report about KiwiSaver released today calling for the government to revise the scheme. So what's different about this one? Well, I guess you could say it sort of pulled together all the other things we've been saying about KiwiSaver for some time now in a comprehensive report to provide to the government. So maybe now they will act to make some of the changes that have been recommended. And it really looks at this sort of, the three sort of issues. I mean, are we saving enough? Um, older people who are closer to retirement, are their savings diversified enough? And do younger savers know enough, understand enough about what's happening? And it's, you know, and it's not just younger savers that understand enough. There's a lot of people that don't understand enough. So this really sort of addresses those issues in one comprehensive document, which they can give to the government and say, here you go, this is what we would like to see. And there are some issues there for, say, older retire uh, people that are getting close to retirement. People are living longer, they're working longer, and there's a push so that people can save longer in Kiwi Savers. That's one of the recommendations. The other is to provide more information to people and to allow people to save more through that mechanism so that everyone can retire with more money. Well, that's a good idea, right? This is the end of money week, so, you know, a bad way to leave it. Yeah, but maybe not so cheery as there's been an annual report about the number of bankruptcies that's turned up a few surprises. Yeah, so on one hand, the number of bankruptcies overall is down 5%. Great. Pretty good, right? Yeah. But amongst younger, uh, younger people, that's under 25s, the number is like, it's up tenfold from where it was four years ago. So four years ago, we're talking like 20 individuals were bankrupt in that age group. Now it's over 200. So what's going on? Actually, it turns out that money is easy to come by. People are wanting to be independent sooner than later. And sometimes they get into trouble, either because they, you know, they got sick, uh, they had some bad luck, or maybe they even lost their job. Another surprise out of that report is that there's a gap between men and women. So in Australia, it's pretty even men and women 
basically go bankrupt about at the same rate, but not in New Zealand. Women are uh, less likely to go bankrupt in New Zealand than men. I asked the reason why the Australian fellow I spoke to thought perhaps it was because men controlled the purse strings, but we know that's not true. <laughs> Indeed. Well, what, what happened on the markets today, Nona? Uh, well, actually, after a really crazy kind of week with a lot of volatility, we ended down just a handful of points. There's six points down to 9,095 and on light volume. Uh, the New Zealand dollar is also a little change, trading just to have, uh, at 65.8 US cents, which is where it was yesterday. 91.8 Australian, again, the same as yesterday, and 50.9 pence. But we can expect there to be some volatility over the weekend. Lots of uh, potential surprises coming out of the United States on trade and and in Europe, so we'll see what happens. Could be an interesting business news on Monday then. It could definitely be so. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's our business reporter, Nona Peltier there. Well, hundreds of would-be first home buyers will have their first chance to look at what a Kiwi build home looks like tomorrow uh, when the McLennan development in the Auckland suburb of Papakura hosts its first open homes. The Housing Minister, Phil Twyford, told media last weekend he was giddy with excitement seeing his flagship project in the flesh. But what about those who could actually be moving into them? Our reporter Tom Furley and cameraman Dan Cook went to find out. Meet Robert Veal. The 24-year-old Aucklander is one of the 40,000 people looking to step onto the property ladder through the government's Kiwi Build programme. The 18 homes in Papakura's McLennan development are the first to become available, 12 of which are three-bedroom, one-and-a-half bathroom properties. The price tag, $579,000. We took Robert to have a look. In the living room... It's far bigger than I was expecting. It's bigger than half the lounges that I would have had while I was flatting, especially in Dunedin. Quite spacious. So what does Robert make of the garden? Yeah, well, I mean, you could put a barbecue out in there and a few deck chairs and be grateful that summer's coming up. But no, it looks quite good. I'm glad that there is some lawn space. Back in the kitchen... Are you much of a cook? Are you going to... You're using this space a lot? Uh, spag bowl and pasta bake is basically my repertoire, I think, but... Um, no, no, it'll, it'll f fit your purpose then. Yeah, it does everything I need it to. What about the bathrooms? I'm also surprised with such a small house that it's got two, like, lavatories. That's really lucky. I guess the most important thing with the shower is the pressure. I wonder if it... I wonder if it's hooked up. Oh, yeah, got, what, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean that works. It's not like super high pressurised, but it's all you need. The house has a separate toilet. What do you reckon? Um, uh, well, I'm not sure I'd be able to, like the sink seems to be placed in a pretty weird place. Robert takes a seat. The sink's just a little... Yeah, I mean you're quite broad, right? Yeah. In the smallest, most likely a children's bedroom, the neighbour's brick wall is literally within arm's reach. What do you think of this view? Yeah, unfortunate, but I think a necessity. Beggars can't be choosers to a certain degree. Um, and if anything, I guess this it is a bedroom, right, on ground level, so it does add to your privacy a little bit. Robert stands taller than your average New Zealander, so what does he think of the master bedroom? They've got a space here for the desk that I was hoping for, um, and so that, that makes a world of difference for me. Like, all I need in a room is a bed and a desk, but... Yeah, um, I need at least a double just because of how long I am. Um, and the room can c cater to that, still have plenty of uh, space to walk around. But it's, I'd, I'd be getting with this house with, uh, with my brother, and we're both six foot four, so I think we'd be doing paper, scissors, rock as to who got what room. While he rates the house a solid seven out of ten overall, the location gets the thumbs down, and just a two out of ten. The main limiting factor is, as I say, the area. Um, I would actually have to probably change my job to be able to keep up with a lifestyle from based from this house because a 40 minute plus commute in the morning uh, to work would be uh, pretty much impossible and th th that's how long it took me to get here from town this morning without traffic going uh, uh, against the flow of traffic so in, in peak hours um, I won't get in for an hour at least. At 10 o'clock in the morning, an Uber would have cost us more than $50 to get into town. When we checked earlier at around 8.30, that figure was closer to $95.
For people like Robert, living close to public transport is essential to get to work to go about their daily lives. But unfortunately for them, according to the Auckland Transport mobile app, it's going to take an hour and 40 minutes to get from McLennan Park into the CBD. That includes a bus and a train leaving from here, Papakura train station. They do have the option to drive here and drop their car off, but I'm told that the car park fills up by 7 o'clock. There are some saving graces. It's close to sports facilities, including Bruce Pullman Park, and shops and a supermarket are a 20-minute walk away. Up to 1,000 people are expected to take a look when the show opens to the public tomorrow. People who have registered for Kiwi Build and have pre-approval can enter the ballot from Monday with a successful residence drawn in early October. For Checkpoint, Tom Fewley. The government's announced the largest funding allocation so far from its provincial growth fund. Just over $150 million will be spent in the Tairawhiti Gisborne region on the North Island's east coast on roads, forestry and tourism. Paloma Magoni reports. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern made the announcement this afternoon to a crowded room at the Works restaurant on the Gisborne waterfront. Ms Ardern says the funding will help Tairawhiti reach its full economic potential. This is a surge region, we call it a surge region, and a region where actually there is disparity. Uh, the average household incomes aren't keeping pace with what's happening nationally, nor is the employment rate. But actually, turn that on its head, it's not about the negative stats, it's about the potential, the unrealised potential of Tairawhiti. The Minister for Regional Economic Development, Shane Jones, says it's a massive allocation. This is a sum of putia that is dedicated to the Tairawhiti that is larger than anything that my rangatira Winston Peters, whose memory is pretty good, can recall. The largest chunk is $137 million for roading. Steve Brain from the local economic development organisation Activate Tairawhiti says it will be money well spent. Uh, we're the second largest geographic uh, region in the country with one of the smallest population bases so the roading infrastructure is a real challenge. Um, we need to have it uh, in place, uh, everything else, uh, uh, the success of everything else comes off the back of having a strong roading infrastructure. 13.3 million will go towards tourism, including refurbishing Gisborne Airport. And there's 1.3 million for forestry projects, including a forestry training school and increasing the amount of wood that can be processed at the Far East Sawmill. So what do Gisborne locals think of the cash injection? Good thing, yep. We need, our roads really need, badly need to be fixed up, especially when you're travelling out of town or even around the, you know, up the coast and things, but yep. No, that sounds good. That will, that will be good so they can sort that sort of stuff out. All, all that money that would come into Gisborne, absolutely into our roads, into our rail and also our tourism. We've got, we've got, we've got the weather, eh? Suits and the beaches. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they always come here, get away from Auckland. It's worth coming here. And the Prime Minister says she hopes Gisborne people will soon be enjoying more job opportunities that the money will help create. For Checkpoint, Paloma Migoni. There have been tense scenes at the UN Security Council a day after the British government named and charged two Russian military intelligence officers for the nerve agent attack in Salisbury on a former Russian spy and his daughter. In a joint statement, France, Germany, Canada and the US all backed Britain and agreed that the Russian government almost certainly approved the attack. Russia's continuing to deny involvement in the poisoning and used the tense meeting to ridicule the British investigation. Here's the BBC's James Lansdale. Two Russian military intelligence officers, alias Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Borishov, flying to Britain in March, taking the train to Salisbury, allegedly laying a trail of deadly nerve agent, on orders, ministers say, from the very top. All of which, British diplomats in New York said, was reckless and malign behaviour by one of the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. One P5 member has undertaken a pattern of behaviour which showed that they tried to murder the Skripals. They played dice with the lives of the people of Salisbury. They work in a parallel universe where the normal rules of international affairs are inverted. Russia said that neither its military intelligence organisation, known as the GRU, or President Putin, had anything to do with the attack. 
and its ambassador insisted Britain's accusations were unacceptable. The Russian Federation categorically rejects all unfounded accusations uh, regarding its uh, involvement in poisoning with toxic chemicals. London needs this story for just one purpose, to unleash a disgusting anti-Russian hysteria. Back in March, officials at the Foreign Office were successful in building an international alliance against Russia, convincing 28 countries to expel around 150 Russian diplomats. And the challenge now for Britain is to step up that international pressure. But that won't be easy because there are some countries in Europe that are reluctant to antagonize Russia any further, particularly with new sanctions. For now, the leaders of France and Germany joined their British, American and Canadian counterparts in issuing a joint statement expressing their full confidence that this operation was almost certainly approved at a senior government level in Russia. They also agreed to disrupt together the hostile activities of foreign intelligence networks on their territories. Madam President, in light of these very serious elements, I would like to express the profound concern of my country and reiterate our condemnation of such actions, which are unacceptable. While this incident was in Salisbury, who is to say it couldn't have happened in Paris or Amsterdam or Addis? But we must now help our British friends find the two Russian suspects they have identified. The question now is whether this diplomatic support for Britain at the UN will turn into joint action on the ground, targeting Russia with new sanctions. James Landale with that report. Well, to the United States now, where leading members of the Trump administration are lining up to deny they were responsible for an explosive article in the New York Times about the goings-on inside the White House. The anonymous article was written by a senior White House official and claims there's a quiet resistance going on to stop Donald Trump's worst impulses and to protect the American people from their own president. There's feverish speculation over who the author is as the manhunt for the person continues inside the White House. The BBC's Nick Bryant reports. This American stately home is now the scene of a Washington whodunit. Which administration official was in the New York Times with an article stabbing the president in the back? The anonymous editorial claims some Trump appointees are working diligently to frustrate parts of his agenda, that he's impetuous, adversarial, petty, ineffective, anti-democratic, that his presidency is defined by amorality. God bless you and thank you, Mr. Thank president. You very much. The article struck Washington like a lightning bolt, and shortly afterwards, at a meeting with American sheriffs, the president delivered his unsmiling response. If the failing New York Times has an anonymous editorial, can you believe it? Anonymous, meaning gutless, a gutless editorial. Uh, we're doing a great job. The poll numbers are through the roof. Our poll numbers are great. And guess what? Nobody is going to come close to beating me in 2020. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> The White House issued a statement calling for the coward who wrote the article to resign. The president demanded the New York Times turn him or her over to the government for national security purposes. There was also this one-word tweet written in capital letters asking, treason? With the rumour mill in overdrive, even the vice president had to issue a denial saying it wasn't me. Anyone who would write an anonymous editorial smearing this president, who's provided extraordinary leadership for this country, uh, should not be working for this administration. They ought to do the honorable thing and they ought to resign. But look, the, the bottom line is the American people see through all of this. But the article reinforces the central narrative in this explosive new book from Bob Woodward, that administration officials are trying to protect the American people from America's elected leader. So who of all the president's men and women make up this quiet resistance? How are you going to catch the op-ed writer, Mr. President? With more than 20 cabinet officials issuing denials, it remains Washington's great unanswered question. For critics of the president, this article offers proof of a White House in chaos. For his supporters, it backs up his fervent claim that the political establishment and liberal media is out to get him, that what he calls the deep state is trying to subvert his presidency. Here's Nick Bryant reporting there from Washington. 
An Auckland mother has launched a petition calling on the government to fund EpiPens, which she says many families can't afford. The auto-injectors contain adrenaline and are self-administered when someone suffers an anaphylactic shock. Despite New Zealand having some of the highest rates of allergic diseases in the world, auto-injectors aren't funded here. Victoria Johnson says she launched a petition after her eight-year-old son James had a serious reaction to a wasp sting. She told me at more than $100 each, many families can't afford an EpiPen. I asked her what she now needed to have at home in case James is stung again. Anaphylaxis, um, you have to have two things happen, not just swelling, um, you then the breathing difficulty and also your blood pressure um, has to drop, which is what happened in the ambulance on our driveway. Um, they gave him the adrenaline via a needle in the ambulance before they took him off. Um, and we've since discovered via um, pinprick tests at Starship what the um, allergen was and that it was a wasp sting. Um, so now we are having to carry um, an auto-injector everywhere we go. Um, uh, two, preferably, because one may not work the first time. Um, yeah, and that was, came as a, quite a big shock to us because we didn't realise they weren't funded in New Zealand. Uh, yeah. It just made me think of all, all those people that can't afford them. Yeah, so how it much are they heart. costing you? Um, there's, it's a range. You can't, there's no fixed price. You can go to your local pharmacy and be quoted $175. Or like we did, we kind of, you know, were shocked and walked away and looked online to see if we can get a better price. Um, and we did, we got ours for 110 but it's still, that's just for one. And they run yeah. out, don't they? So it's 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 yeah. a regular cost, not a one-off sort of thing. Yes, that's right. It expires, and if you're lucky, you'll get a longer expiry date than you know than another one that's on the shelf. We've been quoted 105 from overseas, but the, the, it's got a short shelf life because there's a worldwide shortage of the brand EpiPen. Um, there are other auto injectors out there on the market. This is something that I'm trying to stress. That hasn't been covered before because there are other options. We've just not got any access to them in New Zealand. Um, yeah. Yeah. And what I about? Wish we did. What about when James is at other places, like at school or um, you know, with relations? Do, do you try and have pens in those places as well? Children that go to school need to take one to school. We home educate, which um, just you know is is great. And I have got a an ampule and a syringe and a needle, which. I have had training in twice so because I wasn't happy the first time. I still felt nervous, so I asked around and I've had training again. Um, yeah, but it's still a frightening prospect to administer a needle, you know, from an amp a glass ampule with yeah. the correct dosage when and so, your hands are shaking. Yeah, so is that so? Pharmac are saying, well, we don't need to fund EpiPens because, because we fund a needle and syringe. Yes, that's right. But you're saying it's yeah. actually, That's they're really acceptable. tricky to use. Yes. People, it's, okay, in my case, I can, I can look out for James, but other people have to do this themselves. There's adults, you know, that have to do it themselves and they're unable to because they are, their bodies are, you know, they're, they're going through an anaphylactic reaction. They can't, with, you know, they can't administer a needle that way. Um, and children that do go to school must, they can't take this needle and this ampule, they must provide an EpiPen or an auto-injector to the school for them to administer it there. And it must be just a frightening thought sending a child off and every day as well for someone else to look after. So, so what do you want to happen now? Uh, for um, EpiPens or an auto-injector to be funded for everyone. There should be no discrimination. You know, this is life or death. It's, you know, no one asks for this to happen to themselves. It's, it's, you know, it's just one of those awful things. It came out of the blue. You know, we didn't know he was allergic. It just happened, and now we're having to um, live with it. Yeah, forever. Are, are these funded in other countries? Um, they're funded in UK, in definitely in the UK, and definitely in Australia. So now, how's your petition going? Have you had many signatures yet? Yeah, so, so far we've got over 1,400 signatures. Um, a lady in the past um, raised 10,000 signatures, so, I mean, that, that's just amazing. And I'd love to, 
you know, equal that or exceed that. If if all you know, all the New Zealanders get behind us, everyone with an allergy, please support them. Um, you never know when you're faced with somebody having an anaphylactic shock, and you have to help them. And that's Victoria Johnson talking to me there. And we asked um, Farmac for a response. And in a statement, as Director of Operations, Lisa Williams, said that Farmac funds adrenaline ampules, which cost about a dollar each and contain the same active ingredients as EpiPens. She said Farmac works within a fixed budget, which means it has to make difficult choices about the use of funding to obtain the best health outcomes for all New Zealanders. It's not convinced, it says, at this time that funding auto injectors would be the next best the be, next best spend of its budget and Ms Williams said Pharmac remained in close contact with potential suppliers and hoped to negotiate an affordable long-term funding agreement. Well, billions of dollars worth of roads, pipes and other local council infrastructure are at risk from rising sea levels. The preliminary findings from a Tonkin and Taylor report were released today, giving councils a clearer picture of the risks that climate change poses to their communities. Local Government New Zealand says it's time to put scientific facts before the emotions of those affected. Our reporter Charlie Drever filed this report. Tonkin and Taylor's findings were presented at Local Government New Zealand's Climate Change Symposium on Wellington's waterfront, a suitable location as they discussed the threat of sea levels rising. It showed that a 0.5 to 1 metre rise in sea levels will expose about $1 billion of council transport and roading infrastructure and about $1 to $2 billion of water infrastructure. The company's infrastructure resilience specialist James Hughes says he hopes to eventually highlight which councils face the biggest risks. And the question is for them what do they do about that and how do they move through I guess processes and have policies, changes to their district plans potentially, invest in resilience and other mechanisms with their community to try and understand what their options are going forward. Mr Hughes expects to have a final report out later this year. This follows a 2015 report from the former Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment, Jan Wright, which found at least 9,000 homes around the country were lying less than 0.5 metres above spring high tides. Councils today warned of the strain this can cause between residents and the council. Nikki Williams from the Carpety District Council gave a cautionary tale about her council adding properties to the coastal hazard zone, which led to court action. We've been involved in the litigation relating to coastal hazard provisions and zones and we've tried and I guess at the time failed to really engage with our community and through that process really we lost the trust of a sector of our community and so now we're trying to start again. Nikki Williams expressed the need to include residents when it comes to these assessments to prevent them from being surprised and reacting negatively to proposals. But LGNZ President Dave Cole says while it's important to keep residents involved, an evidence-based response is needed more than an emotive one. There's no point in giving too much credence to push back from communities or individuals if what they're demanding simply isn't going to be possible. Dave Cole says local councils need better legislative support from central government to give them greater powers to take action. They need to be enabled to do that and not subject to unreasonable challenge just because of the self-interest of some groups, because ultimately they're doing what they have to do to protect future generations. There's no point in letting people uh, build on land and then 20 years down the track it's untenable and they've got to retreat from it. And in the meantime the developer's taken his or her several million dollars of profit and, and absconded. In addition, he's wanting a National Climate Change Adaptation Fund because the billions of dollars needed to prepare for climate change simply can't be raised by local government alone. In Wellington, for Checkpoint, Charlie Drever. And thank you, Charlie, for that report about the dilemma faced by councils as climate change creeps ever closer. And after six tonight, we have the embattled MP Claire Curran. More on her resignation um, as a government minister today, so when she cited relentless and intolerable pressure for that. And we're going to have more on that, a bit of analysis from our political editor, Jane Patterson. Uh, we hear from the mother of a woman whose partner has been sentenced to at least 11 
seven years behind bars for her murder. Uh, she has a simple message for him, rot in prison, uh, as you left Kim to rot in a lake. She spoke to reporters after her daughter's husband was uh, sentenced for her murder. And we hear from a Dunedin woman who was fed up with living in a mouldy, cold and rotting rental property. And she says she space, uh, faced spending nights in her car because uh, there's nowhere else to go. So we've all got all that and more coming up after six o'clock. And remember, we love to have your feedback and there's lots of ways that you can get hold of us. You can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. Um, you can Facebook us, Checkpoint with John Campbell. He's not here tonight, but of course, uh, the show's still got his name on it. So send us your feedback via Facebook or you can email us checkpoint at radionz.co.nz and also don't forget you can watch us online on Facebook Live at rnz.co.nz slash checkpoint on Freeview Channel 50 and you can watch us um, on that free-to-air TV on Face TV Sky Channel 83. Here's Katrina with the news. RNZ News at 6. Maloe Lele, good evening. Call Katrina Batten, Tene. The National Party's leader says Claire Curran's resignation from her ministerial portfolios has done real damage to the credibility of both the Prime Minister and the government. Ms Curran contacted the Prime Minister last night to say she was resigning as the pressure had become too much. The Labour MP has been in the spotlight after being demoted from Cabinet for failing to record meetings properly. She also failed to answer questions in Parliament on Tuesday over using a personal Gmail account to arrange meetings. National Simon Bridges says the public deserves to know what other government business Ms Curran has been conducting using her personal email. The only way we will know if there is more to this or not is by uh, the Gmail account and the official information within that being released. Uh, that needs to happen. Simon Bridges, the National Party leader. The mother of Kim Richmond, who was killed by her partner and then left in a lake for 10 months, says she hopes the same happens to him. Corey Jeffries, who's 46, was today sentenced in the High Court in Hamilton to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 11 months. Uh, 11 years. Raywin Richmond read a victim impact statement in court before the sentencing. No sentence imposed will ever replace the time we will spend without our daughter, sister, best friend, but most of all, mother to her three children. You may have fathered Kim's children, but you are not fit to be called their father. May you rot in prison as you left Kim to rot in the lake. Raywin Richmond says the fact Jeffries kept up the pretense for 10 months that her 42-year-old daughter had run away from her family disgusts her. Three prison guards have been cleared of assaulting a prisoner at the maximum security prison at Paremoremo and trying to obstruct an investigation. The three were acquitted by a jury in the High Court in Auckland this afternoon. The Crown's case was that in May last year, Desmond Fa'afoy kicked an inmate on the ground after being stabbed in the head by inmates. It said Widamu Paikia came to help and put the prisoner in a leg lock, breaking his leg. His defence was that he was doing his best in the circumstances. Fiji Devasi was accused of attempting to pervert the course of justice by moving his camera away from the scene. His defence was that he was looking for another prisoner. The President of Local Government New Zealand wants councils to have better protection when making decisions in response to climate change. The comments were made today at the Bodies Climate Change Symposium in Wellington, which looked at the upcoming challenges of sea level rise. The President, Dave Cull, says councils need to take action based on facts, but locals need to be kept informed to avoid irrational reactions. He says councils also need better legislative support from central government to prevent necessary decisions being subjected to court action. Donald Trump says he's picked up a lot of support since the New York Times published an anonymous editorial about his White House. In the opinion piece published yesterday, a senior government official slams the US president's leadership style as petty and ineffective. Speaking at a rally in Montana, the president told the crowd that the editorial backfired and he's urged the newspaper to investigate who wrote it. 
For the sake of our national security, the New York Times should publish his name at once. I think their reporters should go and investigate who it is. That would actually be a good school. Donald Trump also hit out at Democrats, claiming they want to steal trillions of dollars from the U.S. public health system and turn America into Venezuela. A high court jury has found one man guilty of murder and a woman guilty of manslaughter, but acquitted three others over the stabbing of an Invercargill teenager near a stadium last year. Jack McAllister, also known as Jade Fern, was knifed 14 times near ILT Stadium Southland about 11pm on June 7, 2017 and died in hospital the next day. Christopher Brown, who's 20, has today been found guilty of his murder following a five-week trial. Laura Sheepers, who's 19, has been found guilty of manslaughter. David Wilson, Natasha Ruffell and a 24-year-old woman with name suppression have all been found not guilty of both murder and manslaughter. Braden Whiting Roth, who wielded the knife, has already pleaded guilty to murder. The first harness racing event in the South Island since the race-fixing scandal surrounding the sport broke this week is on at Christchurch's Addington Raceway. Ten people were arrested by police during Operation Inca and banned from attending any race meetings. Most of the trainers and drivers charged are from Canterbury. The raceway's chief executive, Peter Jensen, expected about 1,200 racegoers tonight. It's five past six. Sports Serena Williams is into the US Open final after cruising past Anastasia Sevastova, 6-3, 6 love, one win away from a record equaling 24th Grand Slam title. The semi-final win continues Williams' remarkable return to top-level tennis, but she declared post-match that she's simply grateful to be able to compete at all. A year ago, I was fighting for literally my life at the hospital after I had the baby. So every day I step out on this court, I am so grateful that I um, have an opportunity to, to play this sport. No matter what happens, the semis, finals, I just feel like I've already won. Serena Williams. The All Blacks captain Kieran Reid believes the desire to win and prove themselves in tomorrow night's clash with Argentina outweighs the team's lack of experience. The New Zealand team is looking to make it three wins from three games in this year's rugby championship. This is arguably the most inexperienced All Blacks side, just 17 test caps among two-thirds of the starting 15. After their captain's run at Trafalgar Park this afternoon, Reid said the inexperience won't matter. We've got some, some fresh faces in there. They're really excited about this challenge and looking forward to getting out there and playing amongst each other. So, look, there's, there's a spark there. Hey, we just need to make sure that we turn up with a, with a great attitude, a lot of physicality, because the Argies are here to you know, certainly uh, come out and, and play hard. So we, we know that and uh, focusing on what we can bring. Karen Reid, the test will be played before a capacity crowd of 21,000 at Trafalgar Park. That's the news. Nurses have been warning of dangerously low staffing levels. They are the glue that holds hospitals together in every way. But will the latest deals really ease the pressure? They cry. Um, they feel very afraid. I had a, a male nurse say to me in a DHB recently that he has an anxiety attack before he goes on every single shift. This week on Insight, Karen Brown goes into a busy ward to see what the job involves and what the future holds. Just after the 8 o'clock news on Sunday morning with Wallace Chapman on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland, Auckland, Coromandel Peninsula. Fine spells today, but a few showers clearing Northland and Auckland this afternoon or evening. Fine tomorrow, apart from isolated showers from afternoon. Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, Eastern Bay of Plenty, the eastern ranges of Taupo and Taihape. Periods of rain heavy at times today with possible thunderstorms about Gisborne and Hawke's Bay. Rain easing to showers tomorrow. Waikato to North Taranaki, the remainder of Bay of Plenty and Taupo. Or also Taumaranui, fine apart from isolated showers in Waikato from tomorrow afternoon. South Taranaki to Kapiti Coast, mainly fine, isolated showers about the hills and ranges. Wellington and Wairarapa, cloudy with a few showers.
For the South Island, mainly fine, however, areas of cloud about North Canterbury and Fiordland and a few showers about coastal Marlborough. And for the Chatham Islands, low cloud and rain, strong southeasterlies rising to gale tomorrow. It's eight and a half past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thanks very much, Katrina. I'm Rowan Quinn here on Checkpoint for John Campbell tonight. The embattled Broadcasting Minister Claire Curran has today resigned as a Government Minister, citing relentless and intolerable pressure. It follows a testing few months for Ms Curran in Parliament, culminating in a bumbling exchange with the National MP Melissa Lee earlier this week over the use of her personal Gmail account for government business. Ms Curran refused to be interviewed today but gave an emotional address to media outside her Dunedin South office this afternoon. I advise the Prime Minister that I have resigned from all my ministerial portfolios. I am, like the rest of you, a human being and I can no longer endure the relentless pressure that I've been under. I've made some mistakes. They weren't deliberate undermining of the political system. But my mistakes have been greatly amplified and the pressure on me has become intolerable. We all bring to our job strengths and weaknesses. Our political system should never try to cast people in the same mould. I was really proud to have served in the Coalition Government Ministry. During my time as a minister, I've worked hard on issues I've really believed in. How to bring more depth, maturity and sustainability to our media system, particularly publicly funded media, to fundamentally make our democracy stronger. How to give New Zealanders more confidence and trust in our political system and the motivation to be active and understand how they can have their voices heard. And how to build an inclusive, productive digital society that leaves no one behind. I'm deeply saddened I won't be able to do that. I thank my Prime Minister for the chance she gave me. I thank all my colleagues and my party for the support, encouragement and solidarity that they show every day. On the question of Gmail use, I use my Gmail account infrequently for work and it would have been discoverable and it hasn't been used to conceal anything. And I will continue as the MP for Dunedin South. Thank you. Well, that's Claire Curran speaking to reporters outside her Dunedin South electorate office. And we've got more on this from our political editor, Jane Patterson. Jane, was this more about the pressure on Claire Curran to resign rather than an admission of wrongdoing? She said that she had really believed in the portfolios that she had been given. And ironically, one of those includes, of course, the open government portfolio, which has become a bit of an object of ridicule, given that the minister's main blunders had been for not disclosing a meeting, of course, in the first controversy under which um, she lost her cabinet portfolios. But then also the way, as I said, she's been handling ministerial portfolios. Another ministerial communication, I'm sorry, another um, very important portfolio, of course, is the broadcasting portfolio that now goes to her colleague Chris Farfoy and contained within that is the RNZ Plus um, significant policy that Labour had been progressing and that had been driven by Claire Curran. And now, Jane, this morning the Prime Minister said that she had no intention of firing Claire Curran, but she'd actually already accepted her resignation. Is a little bit disingenuous there, perhaps? The Prime Minister left the clear impression in that interview that Claire Curran really would remain on as Minister. Now, of course, we know now that when she did that interview, Ms Ardern had already accepted the resignation of Claire Curran or that it had been offered to her and it was clear that she was going to go. So if you take a purely semantic look at that interview, at no point did she answer a question in relation to Claire Curran resigning. Um, she answered questions about whether she would act against her and fire her as a minister, but definitely questions around the impression that created. In the meantime, of course, the Prime Minister's staff were really scrambling to try to get the paperwork in place. Things have to be signed off in terms of the warrant and the Governor-General staff have to be told there are a number of elements that had to be in place before that formal announcement could be made but 
In the meantime, there were a number of hours that the Prime Minister had absolutely left the impression that Claire Curran was safe. And in fact, that was the headline that the media outlet ran with, which wasn't a direct quote from the article, but that has really stirred things up and, and has put now more pressure on the Prime Minister in the wake of Claire Curran's f uh, resignation itself. So it sounds like, you know, often when you would have someone resigning, you might say, right, that's drawn a line in the issue, but do you think this one could still have some political legs? The leader of the National Party, Simon Bridges, came out very quickly after the resignation and said there are still questions that have not been answered about Claire Curran and her handling of this information. So with her resigning as Minister, she's no longer bound to get up in Parliament and answer questions um, from the opposition, but those questions can go to other ministers, including the new Broadcasting Minister, Chris Farfoy, in terms of how the office had dealt with that. Now, they are still... Uh, National still wants all of the Gmail, um, the Gmail emails to be released to see exactly what kind of business she was conducting on that personal email account. And I, I have to say, there's nothing wrong with using a personal email in itself. It's the way that that information is then uh, archived or loaded into the official system so that if anyone comes back asking questions under the OIA or written parliamentary questions then it's transparent for all. The other direction I'm sure the opposition is going to take as well is questioning the Prime Minister's handling of this, questioning her judgment including that interview and the comments that she made today and whether she should have acted against Claire Curran more quickly. And thanks Jane, that was our political editor Jane Patterson speaking from Parliament. Well, the mother of a woman whose partner's been sentenced to at least 11 years behind bar for her, bars before her murder has a simple message for him. Rot in prison as you left Kim Richmond to rot in a lake. The 42-year-old's body was found in her vehicle submerged in Lake Arapuni, not far from her South Waikato home in June last year, 10 months after she was killed. Corey Jeffries was found guilty in July of murdering her and today was sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of 11 years by Justice Fitzgerald in the High Court in Hamilton. Kim Richmond's mother, Raywin, who now has custody of her three grandchildren, spoke to reporters outside court. She was asked about Corey Jeffrey's behaviour in the last two years. He harassed us for two whole years um, regarding furniture, etc., taken from the house, saying it was matrimonial property. They were forgetting that Kim was a 50-50 partner and everything. We took the furniture because someone had to move it out of the house. The children needed furniture. Remembering that we were called over by the police at the time, locked our house and walked out. You had a good hard look at Jeffries when you finished giving your victim impact I did. statement. How, how upset and how, I guess, um, you know, distraught are you by all of this? Very distraught because throughout the trial and today, I never saw him shed a tear, did you? That must be heartbreaking as a mother to see Absolutely that. heartbreaking for being with someone for 26 years. We put him on a pedestal, you know. How are the children doing? Children doing fine, absolutely fine, growing up as normal children do. How has your life changed because of that with the children now? Our life's changed dramatically. We just started retirement. We're in our 70s, both of us, so it's starting all over again with teenagers. I guess a teenagers are old enough to look after you a bit, though, eh? Oh, I don't know about so. that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do now? What do we do now? Just care for the children. Nothing else but care for the children. We're up at 6 in the morning for the children to catch the bus at 7, so it's no sleep-ins. <laughs> what is your message to Corey Jeffries today? Rot in prison as you left Kim to rot in the lake. We never got to say goodbye to Kim and nor did the children. Do you feel like you have any closure today? In a way, yes, he's where he should be. Um, but it's very hard for the children. They've lost both parents now, not just their mum. They've lost their dad as well because he's not fit to be their dad, but he is their dad. Raywin, do you accept that last minute explanation by Corey about how Kim might have died? Not really, no. Uh, my belief, he's had her round the throat before, that's all I'll say.
Were you expecting more than 11 years? We would have liked more than 11 years, but New Zealand law, yes, we would have liked at least 15 non-parole. And that's uh, Ray Wynne Richmond, the mother of murdered woman Kim Richmond, speaking outside the High Court in Hamilton today. A Dunedin woman who is fed up with living in a mouldy, cold and rotting rental property says she faced spending nights in the car with her son as there was nowhere else to go. Rose and her 12-year-old son moved into the Clyde Hill property in April but soon discovered mould and water damage as winter settled in. She says she's been forced to seek emergency housing to escape a damp home that's making her family sick. Rose took our Dunedin reporter Tess Brunton on a tour of the house. The worst part would probably have to be the kitchen ceiling. Yeah, I have made thumb holes and finger holes by just going to touch it and my fingers have gone right through it. And that's the entire ceiling. So this is my biggest worry, is that it's going to come down. Every time heavy rain or snow is predicted, Rose isn't sure whether her kitchen ceiling will hold up. A couple of bowls and towels lay around in case water leaks through, but she says it's absorbed by the rotten wood in the ceiling. She says the three-bedroom house is not worth $330 a week when it's just making her and her son sick. When I first moved in, I noticed the moisture and I was told it was because the carpets had been done. I needed to move in quickly. So um, they have said that because of that, they've let me move in when they weren't done. I never asked for that. I was quite adamant I didn't want to move into a house that was wet. There is obvious water damage in the lounge and most of the wooden window sills are rotten. Rose, who doesn't want her full name revealed, says she fought to get out of the lease, but has stayed in the house as there is nowhere else to go. She's applied for several other rental properties, but says there are 20 to 25 people at viewings. With no new home to move into, she's considered living in her car and has approached Work and Income and Housing New Zealand about emergency accommodation. And I can't stay here because I'm, I'm just sick and I'm not eating and I'm stressed. And yeah, I'm at breaking point pretty much and it's starting to affect my son. Rose says she raised the issues with the Realtors Mana Property Management, who she says told her to contact the Prime Minister if she wasn't happy. The management group sent her a letter in August saying they would repair the house, including repairing the roof over the kitchen, sending in mould specialists and requesting builder quotes to fix the window sills and stiff windows. The letter also states Rose may not have met her responsibilities as a tenant to report damage or keep the house dry. Rose is outraged, saying she runs a dehumidifier and a heat pump on a dry cycle and airs out the house most days, but it's not working and it's costly. She's considering taking the management group to the Tenancy Tribunal. The real estate are claiming that the um, issues I've had are my own doing. So firstly, I'd like them to take responsibility and I'd like them to acknowledge that the house shouldn't have been rented. I moved into this house on the good faith that going through a real estate agency, you were guaranteed a good house and instead they've just blamed me for it. It's quite degrading. Out of options and facing moving into her car, Rose has been allowed to move into a two-bedroom unit at the retirement village she works at as a temporary solution until she can find a new home to rent. New healthy home standards, which will set minimum requirements for heating, insulation, ventilation and moisture in residential rental properties, will be in place by the 1st of July next year. In Dunedin, mō te hōtaka o te ahipo nei, ko te and RNZ's made multiple attempts to contact Mana Property Management today without success. To India now, where has an historic decision, the Supreme Court has ruled that gay sex is no longer a criminal offence. The ruling overturns a 2013 judgment that upheld a colonial era law known as Section 377, under which gay sex is categorised as an unnatural offence. The move has been applauded around the world, but in India there's still significant opposition. The BBC's Devia Arya reports. It's a wave of relief. The end of two decades of legal struggle to take out a Victorian law that made gay sex criminal. The court struck off the law and said it was a weapon for the harassment of India's lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans community. Two consenting adults have sex of any type in private that there is consent and it is in private, it will not be an offence under 377. I haven't come out to my parents, so I'm going to do that <laughs> tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, this was uh, like a huge turn of events. I didn't really expect, you know, like the whole 
I just came here to listen to the uh, whatever uh, the, the verdict was and now I'm out. The colonial era law known as Section 377 categorized gay sex as an unnatural offense and was decriminalized in 2009 only to be made criminal again in 2013 after an appeal. In its final judgment, the Supreme Court has now said that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is a violation of fundamental rights. The rains clearly haven't dampened the spirits here. They all want to soak in the moment and celebrate their freedom. The 157-year-old colonial law meant that there was a sense of fear and it pushed many into the closet. But today, they are out and proud. Activists say there is a tough battle of social stigma and homophobia still to be fought. It will take a lot of time. We have to fight the stigma in our home, in the neighborhood, uh, the, the friend circle, in offices. That, I mean, it's a long battle. <laughs> This victory came after a long legal fight with religious groups and the government. And it's only the beginning. Now they dare to dream of the right to marry, adopt and inherit property, just like heterosexuals. And that report from the BBC. Well, talks scheduled for tomorrow between Turkey, Russia and Iran would appear to be the final chance to avoid another human catastrophe in Syria. At issue will be the fate of the rebel-held province of Idlib on the Turkish border in the north of the country. Idlib's where rebel groups have fled as Syrian government forces slowly and painfully take back to the territory they lost earlier in the Syrian civil war, at a time when Bashar al-Assad couldn't rely on the military muscle of Russia. Now Idlib is the last part of the country under rebel control and its future looks increasingly bleak. The BBC's Quentin Somerville reports. The world for Abu Ibrahim's family just keeps getting smaller. Nine of them have two rooms in a building shared with 60 families. For those opposed to Bashar al-Assad, Idlib is the last refuge. And now it and Abu Ibrahim's family are under threat. Turkey has closed its border and people trying to cross are getting hit by snipers. I'm worried about my children and there is no place to go. It's very difficult to move and run with children when the bombing is happening. Turkey and the other routes are closed. We are trapped here. The battle proper for Idlib hasn't begun yet, but in Al Tamana to the south are getting a taste of what's to come. Tens of thousands of regime forces are standing by, along with dozens of Russian and regime aircraft. The UN has warned that in this cruelest of wars, Idlib will be the perfect storm. The population of the province has doubled as the opposition and Islamists took refuge from a regime on a victory roll. On the streets of Idlib city, they're expecting the worst. People are afraid of chemical weapons like chlorine or sarin, but in God's will, we are prepared for them. Rebel groups are digging in. This is the Turkish-aligned Felak al-Sham. We've been preparing and digging trenches, giving our soldiers extra training on all kinds of weapons. We are prepared to defend our territory against the regime and the Russian invaders. As Felax fighters man the defences, Russia says it's got its eyes on other rebels, HTS Nusra, the Al-Qaeda-linked jihadists who control much of the province. Moscow is promising to liquidate them. But Syria's conflict isn't just a war of armies, it's a war on people. There are more than two and a half million trapped here. Atma camp for the displaced stretches from the Turkish border to the horizon. There's no room for more people and there's no escape. The fate of the last fight in Syria's civil war appears set before it begins. Rebel Idlib may be the battle already lost. It's the BBC's Quentin Somerville reporting uh, from Idlib in northern Syria. Well, finally tonight, college fraternities in the United States are known for their hard-drinking, hard-partying members, as anyone who remembers the movie Animal House will know. The societies for men are seen by many as highly prestigious, but in a huge shake-up of the rules, strong alcohol like vodka, whiskey and tequila are being banned from frat houses. The BBC's Charlotte Gallagher has this report. 
Well, well, well. Looks like somebody forgot there's a rule against alcoholic beverages. In fraternities on probation. A scene from the 1970s comedy Animal House, just one of the films about the U.S. tradition of fraternities and sororities. But in recent years, fraternities in particular have been under intense scrutiny because of the behaviour of their members, who are usually from the most privileged sections of society. They've been implicated in a series of sexual assaults and been blamed for the deaths of young men in alcohol fueled hazing ceremonies. It's believed 70 people have died in the initiation drinking games since 2000. At Penn State University last year, 19-year-old Timothy Piazza fell to his death after drinking 18 drinks in 82 minutes. It was 12 hours before his fraternity brothers called an ambulance. Now the organisation which represents the majority of fraternities has voted to ban strong alcohol from all frat houses. Even members over 21 will not be exempt. Beer and wine will still be allowed under the new rules, which fraternities have been told they must enforce by September next year. And that was Charlotte Gallagher from the BBC reporting there. And that is Checkpoint for this evening and this week. Thanks for joining us on your radio, your TV, online or however you chose to connect with us today. Any stories you miss or any you'd like to hear again, you can catch on rnz.co.nz slash checkpoint or on our Facebook page. And for all the latest news, information, feature stories from New Zealand and around the world, go to the rnz.co.nz homepage. And John will be back with you here on Monday. But for now, for me, Rowan Quinn and the Checkpoint team, have a great night and a lovely weekend. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. In reaction to Claire Curran's resignation from her ministerial portfolios, the National Party wants to know how much government business she conducted using her personal email. The partner of Kim Richmond, whose body was dumped in a lake, was sentenced today in Hamilton to life in prison. And a High Court jury in Invercargill has found one man guilty of murder and a woman guilty of manslaughter, but acquitted three others over the stabbing of a teenager last year. More news and weather at 7. This week on Music 101, we've got The Man From UNCLE. No, no, I'm, I meant the musician, not the TV show. God knows you lonely souls. James Lavelle is in The Man From UNCLE, the band. Also, the head of Moax Records speaks about the new film being made about his career. Also, Don McGlashan is in for the RNZ Music Mixtape, and we celebrate Tawiki Otereo Māori with a very special announcement from Rob Ruha 